Hello, and welcome to Encounters with Polish Literature, brought to you by the Polish Cultural Institute, New York. I'm David Goldfarb, and I'll be your host. In 1905, Henryk Sienkiewicz became the first Polish writer to win a Nobel Prize for Literature, primarily based on the success of his 1896 novel, Quo Vadis, which in Latin means, where are you going? About early followers of Christ and the persecution they suffered under the Romans in the time of Nero. Of course, Sienkiewicz provided a love interest to keep people paying attention, and Hollywood aided up in a 1951 film of the same title with the mid-century stars Robert Taylor, Deborah Kerr, and Peter Ustinov. In Poland, his major work is his historical trilogy set in the 17th century Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania, consisting of three monumental works, with Fire and Sword about the Cossack Rebellion in the lands that are today Ukraine, the Deluge about the Swedish invasion of Poland, and Pan Wojcicki about Polish conflict with the Ottoman Empire. Of course, Henryk Sienkiewicz finds room amid the blood and gore of war for romantic subplots there too. These are novels, after all, on an epic scale, but originally published serially in the newspaper and plotted at the pace of everyday life. Witold Kombrowicz famously called Sienkiewicz a first-rate, second-rate author, meaning that maybe his ideas weren't always so profound, but his characters were well-drawn, his plots are crystal clear and compelling, his humor and descriptions are vivid, and his dialogue is lively and believable. While we've all got the war resulting from the Russian invasion of Ukraine on our minds, I'd like to focus today on his work set in Ukraine. But I have to say, it's not going to be easy because unlike the incredible solidarity that we see today between Poland and Ukraine, Poles and Ukrainians, and we'll talk more about those shifting national categories later, were enemies in the 1600s. The leader of the peasant uprising against Polish landowners and their Jewish agents in 1648 was Bohdan Chmielnicki, who is held up as a national hero to Ukrainians and a villain to Poles and especially to Jews. The novel traffics in anti-Ukrainian stereotypes and glosses over the brutal conditions of serfdom imposed on Ukrainian peasants, presenting the Polish landowners as a civilizing force, though there is plenty of vodka to go around, and we see horrendous cruelty on both sides of the Polish Cossack War in Sienkiewicz's novel. We don't usually think of Poland as a colonial power quite like the British Empire or Belgium, France, or Germany, but how else can we understand what appears to be an exploitative colonial relationship between Poland and the lands beyond the Dnieper River? Maybe it's not exactly the same, but there's something to it. Rather than alighting those difficult issues, I'd like to begin to address them as best we can in our short program by reading and analyzing some passages from With Fire and Sword, and to ask what the issues were in the 17th century when the conflict happened, in the late 19th century when the novel was written, and for us as 21st century readers who have to look beyond these terrible legacies to appreciate the situation that's happening today. Before we meet today's guest who has been writing about these issues, I'd like to thank everyone who has been following and supporting Encounters with Polish Literature. And remind you, click the thumbs up, ring the bell, subscribe, leave a comment to help the program reach more viewers by moving up in the search rankings, okay? Stanley Bill is Associate Professor of Polish Studies and Director of Slavonic Studies at the University of Cambridge. He works on 20th century Polish literature and culture and on contemporary political discourse in Poland. He is the author of Czesław Miłosz's Faith in the Flesh, Body, Belief, and Human Identity, published by Oxford University Press in 2021, and co-editor of the Routledge World Companion to Polish Literature, also published in 2021. He has published translations of Miłosz's novel, The Mountains of Parnassus, maybe you haven't heard of that one, by Yale University Press in 2017, and a selection of short stories by Bruno Schultz entitled Nocturnal Apparitions, published in London in 2022. He is founder and editor at large of the news and opinion website, which I highly recommend, Notes from Poland, 
Stanley, thanks for joining me on Encounters with Polish Literature. Pleasure to be here. Great to have you. So um, in um, this, uh, you know, this is uh, Shinkevich's, um, you know, major Ukrainian novel, one of his most uh, popular novels in Poland, uh, Ogniem i Mieczem, With Fire and Sword. And um, what is the, uh, what's the political background? What's going on between uh, Poland and uh, what today we think of as the Ukrainian lands? Before we begin, because we are discussing a novel today that is set in Ukraine and the Ukrainian lands of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, um, I, I'd like to take the opportunity just to express uh, solidarity with the people of Ukraine uh, today who are fighting a war uh, for uh, an existential war against Russian aggression and a war in defense of uh, wider uh, European values and to just uh, express my recognition and admiration for the Ukrainian people in that struggle. Um, it seems appropriate uh, given the subject of our uh, conversation today. And before we go on, let me remind people to uh, stay and watch to the credits uh, where we list a number of reliable vetted organizations that you can contribute to if you want to support uh, humanitarian aid and general aid for uh, Ukrainians and uh, for uh, for people fighting in Ukraine. Sienkiewicz is setting this novel in a much earlier period uh, in history uh, from when he's writing. So he's writing in the late 19th century and he's going back into the middle of the 17th century. And he's choosing a period really of, of particular turmoil uh, and of conflict. And the middle of the 17th century in the sort of general uh, progression of the history of the Commonwealth uh, is, is very much a period dominated by war. Uh, and that was, of course, congenial for Sienkiewicz from a certain point of view, because it suits the type of adventure novel uh, that he uh, set himself uh, to write and would allow him to realize this portrait of knightly virtues and of the warrior uh, characters uh, that are in the novel. So certainly that was one reason to choose uh, that period where the Commonwealth uh, is at war. But when he's focusing on this particular region of what you know, even in these times in the 17th century, in the mid 17th century, are, be are beginning to be referred to as Ukraine uh, with somewhat different meaning to what we might you, uh, think of with that term uh, today, but nevertheless with somewhat contiguous lands. But what are essentially the southeastern lands of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, which are inhabited in the large part by people who we might describe as Ruthenian, we might describe as Ukrainian, they're Eastern Slavs, uh, they're Orthodox uh, in religion uh, with some presence of uh, the Greek Catholic faith, which is a minority, but something we can perhaps talk about uh, later. But then with these present, the presence at the same time of Roman Catholic Polish nobility and gentry. And as we might also come to later, this is this is uh, quite a complex question of what is Polish at this time and what is Ukrainian, what is Ruthenian. All of these terms are up for discussion. They're ambiguous and there's debate about how they should be used and what exactly uh, they refer to. Uh, but nevertheless, we have these southeastern uh, lands of the Commonwealth in the period of the 17th century, which are the site of a kind of domestic conflict. And the domestic conflict is between the representatives of the, in very broad terms, in simplifying terms that we should then complicate. Uh, but in a way, these simplifying terms is the way in which Sienkiewicz frames his novel. And that is the conflict between the Roman Catholic Polish representatives of the nobility who are framed as the representatives of the Republic, of the Rzeczpospolita, of the Commonwealth, of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and of its king. And then a band of rebels, a group of rebels that begins a kind of revolution uh, in these southeastern lands, uh, a great rebellion, which historically is often known as the Khmelnytsky uprising because the leading figure is Bogdan Melnitsky, a Cossack, but also a member of the Polish Szlachta in a formal sense, which is something that we can come back to later. Today, a Ukrainian hero from history. You can see Bogdan Melnitsky on the banknotes uh, in, in Ukraine, for example. And it's a kind of uprising against the authority of what's 
perceived as an increasingly oppressive central Polish Roman Catholic power against the prerogatives of these Eastern Slavic groups who are orthodox in their religion. Uh, and the Cossacks are leading this rebellion, but there are other groups that, that join it. And perhaps who the Cossacks are is something else that, that, that needs some kind of definition. Uh, but joining these these warrior bands that were inhabiting the very periphery of the Commonwealth and had been uh, helping uh, the forces of the Commonwealth to defend that periphery against the Tatars and others who were over the border of the Commonwealth, but were increasingly dissatisfied with the deal they were getting from the king and the relations that they had with the local representatives of the Polish gentry, the Polish nobility, the Schlachta and began this armed conflict and it's a conflict in a it's the largest conflict in a whole line of conflicts in this region dating back to the 16th century uh, and, and the cossacks are joined by the local ruthenian peasantry the majority eastern orthodox eastern slavic uh, population or part of that population in what becomes a kind of mass social uprising against again in with inverted commas scare quotes around it Polish authority in these southeastern regions. So it's a sort of civil war, essentially, that is happening in this region. And it's quite complicated, and historians disagree on what the precise reasons for uh, this conflict were and how we would characterize this conflict. Is it essentially a social conflict, which is about lower social orders and then groups that had been excluded from power or felt they'd been excluded from power? So the Cossacks seeking to rise up against the ruling class? Uh, is it a religious conflict between uh, the representatives of this Roman Catholic ruling class against the Eastern Orthodox, uh, uh, from the Eastern Orthodox majority of the region? Um, or is it a proto-national conflict? Now, we can't, of course, use the term national in its modern sense uh, in, if we're talking about the 17th century. Uh, but in popular interpretations, it's often conceived that way. And it is a serious question, the degree to which there is a kind of proto-national or ethnic dimension here. Is this be the beginnings of a Polish-Ukrainian conflict, as it could be perceived? And there's certainly the extent to which writing late in the 19th century, remembering the novel was published in 1884, Sienkiewicz is partly presenting it. Um, in that way as that kind of conflict. But as we may get to later, the lines between Poles and Ukrainians or Ruthenians or Cossacks and what do these terms really mean are not very clear, even in Sienkiewicz's novel. There are often people, you know, you can't tell they're switching sides, right? I mean, so you have registered Cossacks who are uh, who are fighting on the side of the Commonwealth and then they might switch over to Khmelnytsky's, uh, Khmelnytsky's uh, band. And then, uh, you know, Tatars seem to be um, uh, kind of mercenaries, all portrayed always as self-interested uh, in it for uh, whatever kind of profit they can get. Uh, there are uh, German mercenaries kind of in the background uh, Protestants uh, who are uh, who are uh, not not described in very much detail, except that you know they'll work for whoever pays them, uh, and uh, and then you have the you know the as you know as you know the the categories of uh, of, uh, of different types of gentry are uh, often often vague, and then of course there's the question of the Jews. I mean that uh, that uh, you know Khmelnytsky is a uh, is a uh, a Ukrainian hero and a, and a Jewish villain, um, and you know there was. I, I just heard the other day that there was even um, a, a fast day, uh, you know, uh, proclaimed uh, at one point uh, for uh, for Jews, um, you know, massacred in uh, in the Khmelnytsky uprising, which is which is described and alluded to in the novel, but uh, but uh, you don't see the Jews really as individual characters um, like some of the uh, some of the others. Precisely. It, it is it is mentioned in passing. But as you said, you know, there are there are accounts uh, and records from this time and after this time uh, in, in Jewish historiography uh, describing this period as a, as a kind of apocalypse uh, for uh, for Jewish communities uh, in the region. Um, in, in which there were massacres uh, by the, uh, the the rebels. The role of the Jews is there, uh, you know, uh, you know, 
uh, economically is that they're managers for the for you know absentee Polish landlords. Um, you know, in the so they they represent the Polish state uh, certainly to the uh, uh, to the Ukrainians, but of course not every uh, every Jew in Ukraine was uh, was a uh, a manager for the uh, for the uh, for the Polish landlords. Certainly, to view, viewed that way by by the rebels, and then combining that sense of their role in the economic oppression with with anti semitism, with traditional anti semitism of uh, religious and other kinds. But it's interesting just to come on to the novel that in one of the famous scenes of the novel, which is a conversation between one of the main fictional characters with one of the main historical characters, i.e. with Chmielnitsky. It's the conversation of the Polish nobleman hero with Chmielnitsky. And when Chmielnitsky is giving his famous complaint about what his people, as he sees it, have been experiencing, he, he refers to an op- oppression by Jews as uh, as one of the problems, right? that, the, that, uh, that his people have been put in the position of being um, taken advantage of by the Jews who represent the interests of the Polish nobles. So that is very much put uh, at the center of uh, Chmielnitsky's own description of the problem in uh, in the novel. So you can see that anti-Semitic dimension as well. I, I'd like to read that passage more closely, maybe a little later. Um, but uh, but one that I'm thinking of now is like I mean, one way that, you know, that you know, certainly critics from from about the 1990s, uh, like when I was in grad school, uh, you know, started reading this was to look at this as a form of colonialism and put it into the try to understand it in the discourse of uh, uh, to, to understand Eastern Europe in general in the in the discourse of colonialism. And there are certain passages where it, it is it does seem to be compelling. If I, if I can read one. Um, there's this moment where we get inside of uh, the uh, you know the 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 main uh, uh, leader of the uh, of the uh, of the Polish side uh, who is ambiguously Polish, uh, uh, Prince Jeremy uh, Wisniewski, uh, is looking out on the uh, on the landscape. The trumpet sounded. The tabor moved on slowly but steadily, and after a time. Lumni began to be veiled in a blue haze. The houses and roofs were blended into one mass, brightly into one mass, brightly distinct. Then the prince urged his horse ahead and having ridden to a lofty mound, stood motionless and gazed long. That town gleaming there in the sun and all that country visible from the mound was the work of his ancestors and himself. For the Vishnevetskis, he had, had changed that gloomy wilderness of the past into settled country, opened it into the life, opened it to the life of people, and it may be said, created the Trans Dnieper. And the greater part of that work, the prince had himself accomplished. He built those Polish churches whose towers stood there, blew over the town. He increased the place and joined it with roads to the Ukraine. They say the Ukraine, of course, in this uh, 19th century translation uh, by Jeremiah Curtin. Uh, He felled forests, drained swamps, built castles, founded villages and settlements, brought in settlers, put down robbers, defended from Tatar raids, maintained the peace necessary to husbandmen and merchants, and introduced the rule of law and justice. Through him, that country had lived, grown, and flourished. He was the heart and soul of it, and now he had to leave it all. I mean, that sounds like, you know, kind of if you needed a almost textbook description of settler colonialism, um, that's that's kind of it. Ironically, it's very similar to uh, um, uh, Engels description of uh, um, of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, defeat of Native Americans in California. I mean, that he, he felt that, well, yes, they weren't doing anything with the land, so it needed to be uh, developed. Um, but, you know, but it's but as you say, it's more complicated than that. What, what else is is what, what what is, you know, what is, you know, what is colonialist about the novel and what is not? It's a huge question, and there are many different ways to approach this. And as you say, this is a discussion um, that's going on uh, in Poland and in Ukraine and in Lithuania and Belarus about what the nature of the historic... So there are two questions here. First of all, the nature of the Polish-Lithuanian state, and particularly in this period, and particularly in its eastern lands. 
And secondly, how Sienkiewicz uh, represents that reality. Um, so I think first it's worth referencing these debates about the extent to which the Polish-Lithuanian Common Commonwealth was a kind of colonial, colonialist, or even quasi-imperial state with respect to how its rule functioned in the eastern lands. So that's a question that there isn't one answer to. There are many different positions that have been that have been taken. There are Polish scholars increasingly who are inspired by post-colonial theory to look at the type of description that you just gave us um, to suggest that there was a kind of uh, settler colonialism driven by the Polish Roman Catholic center of the Commonwealth uh, that meant one could say that uh, the Polish center had its eastern colonies and increasingly subordinated Ruthenians, uh, the Ruthenian majority of these vast lands uh, to their power, and that the Ruthenian majority, the peasant majority, were laboring in increasingly oppressive conditions for Polish, again, again in inverted commas, Roman Catholic lords on these massive, massive estates with numbered sort of tens of thousands of serfs. Uh, working there, um, and that this could sort of fit into wider models and interpretations of uh, colonial and imperial histories of uh, European powers. Uh, yeah. And and we should make it clear that, that, that serfdom was slavery. I mean, that... Uh, yes, yeah. yes. So a kind, of, a kind of slavery and the conditions, at least some historians argue, were particularly um, oppressive, particularly harsh in those large eastern states. Um, so that's one way of looking at the history. Um, and that's a way of looking at the history that's also been quite commonly presented by Ukrainian historians um, and, and others, uh, but also within Poland, it's important to note. But then there are others that would reject that way of understanding that history and to suggest that, and to point to the way in which the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was a complex composite state that had multiple uh, centers of power and came together through a set of compromises of one kind or another, and that the Eastern lands did not really see Poles moving from the center out to colonize them, um, but a process in which the lords of those territories, the, the, the great lords who came from the Ruthenian uh, princely families um, that can date back to the times of Rus, um, but had been mixed with the Lithuanian, uh, great Lithuanian families in a complex process that we can't really go into, that they were the powers in those territories and that they were essentially Ruthenian powers or Ukrainian powers, if you want to describe them that way, proto-Ukrainian powers. But they just converted to Roman Catholicism and, and that made them in some symbolic way uh, appear Polish, uh, and they were certainly perceived as being Polish to some degree by the local population. That with, uh, colloquially, Roman Catholicism was known as the Polish religion. So those those historians would argue that it's more complex than that. We're talking about a process of multiple directions of uh, of power and of hybridity, fundamental cultural hybridity that it doesn't. It's not the same as. European maritime empires, for instance, where you know Britain uh, sort of conquered countries on the other side of the uh, of the ocean uh, and subordinated them to its central power. So that would be the counter argument against that. Um, so uh, there are different ways of looking at it, but I think certainly this understanding comes through very strongly in Shinkevich because of what he's fundamentally trying to do in the novel and. As he talks about on multiple occasions uh, himself, the purpose of the trilogy, um, it's for the comfort of hearts. This is this well-known phrase about the trilogy, right? that it's written for the comfort of hearts. It's giving the Polish reader in the late 19th century what he or she um, wants. And that means, a, in a way, a kind of compensatory myth or fantasy, or, or perhaps not myth or fantasy, but just a, a, a traveling back in time to a history that embodies a moment of glory and power for the Commonwealth, but really for Poland. Again, whatever that means, it's a term that shifts in its meaning throughout history. But what we have to remember is the Commonwealth has ceased to exist in 1795, almost 100 years before uh, Sienkiewicz publishes uh, this novel. And 
it has been partitioned, as we know, between the three empires of Russia, Prussia, and uh, Austria, and with the largest area, including all of the uh, areas or significant parts of the areas that are the uh, that host the action of this novel uh, in the Russian uh, partition. Some of them also Austria and later Austria-Hungary. But this is a period, of course. Uh, of catastrophe uh, for the Polish-Lithuanian, as it was, state, and for the sense of the Polish nation's sovereignty over and its its autonomy and its political self-rule. It doesn't have that at this time. And so Sienkiewicz's aim is a kind of restoration of national pride. I'm simplifying, of course, at least in a, in a symbolic sphere and allowing readers uh, to uh, witness a period of glory. And that means a kind of myth about Polishness and the function of Polishness in the Eastern lands. And so in a sense, it is true that what Sienkiewicz represents in the novel is that colo- that co- a kind of colonizing myth. So these very stark dichotomies between a barbaric, dark, tumultuous, chaotic, frenzied, violent, uncultivated, wild East and the civilized, uh, cultured, uh, religious, organized, ordered West. And the Polish culture is the representative of the West in that dichotomy. And so in the passage that you quoted, we have this example of of that uh, of the way in which that sort of symbolic contrast is presented in the novel. So the sense that these are lands that were made productive, that were made safe, that were ordered, that were made fertile and fruitful by the efforts of of a symbolically Polish culture, civilization, but also force of arms to protect it, to protect it from enemies further to the east and south, in particular uh, the Tatars. And that therefore in that um, symbolic dichotomy, the Ukrainians or the Cossacks, as they're more often uh, simply called here in the novel, uh, and the Ruthenian peasantry represent the wild, disorganized, frenzied, violent, dangerous element of the east that has been subordinated and subordinated in part for its own good. There are times in the novel where this is specifically what the the polemic that the characters advance, the idea that the uh, desire for independence of the Cossacks is really just a desire for chaos. And it has created violence, death and destruction for the people that it pretends to represent. That that is how uh, the the conflict between the Polish-Lithuanian state and the Cossacks is presented in the novel. Uh, And that's what's needed is the stern order and discipline and control of the civilized, symbolically Western uh, Polish center. So all of those all of those uh, dualisms are obviously quite familiar uh, from, from more broadly, uh, from Orientalist and and colonial literature uh, of the same period in other uh, European countries. But what's very different here is that in Sienkiewicz's case, it's a kind of compensatory fantasy that is being produced in a period in which Poland is not a great power, does not have colonies or an empire, and indeed does not even have a state. Uh, And Poles are a nation without a state. So this is the way that one might understand this this presentation in the novel. And just just to conclude, there's a very famous uh, Polish scholar of Romanticism, Maria Janion, uh, who puts it in terms of, in the period in which Poland is colonized, it was to remind Poles that they were once colonizers. That's sort of how she characterizes this type of representation in it's interesting that it's uh, it's kind of uh, 
you know, you, you put it in terms that makes makes it kind of a lament and in comparison to romantic uh, characterizations of uh, of uh, of the Polish state. I mean, it's um, it's not exactly calling for revolution. Um, it's sort of we're in this period of uh, where, you know, sort of we're past the era of Polish revolutions. Um, and uh, uh, what we have left is the novel, perhaps. So Sienkiewicz comes out of this tradition that's known in positivism, and it's the period of Polish culture uh, that is usually presented in these sort of big chrono- big chronologies, which of course can be contested, uh, that follows Romanticism and is a response to Romanticism and its tradition of, of armed uprising and of messianic faith in the spiritual uh, value of the Polish nation and its destiny to be uh, resurrected and to regain its uh, independence. So after one of a line of failed uprisings, the January uprising of 1863-64, um, th- there there is a sense of uh, despair and that this and that this uh, approach uh, has failed. Uh, of course, I'm giving this sort of simplified narrative of how these cultural movements are usually. Uh, characterized and so positivism what is what follows and positivism is a kind of movement that focuses that's in literature that's in culture that's uh, embedded in in uh, journalistic writings in particular um, and that focuses on more an in, incremental process of improvement of society and progress in economic sphere, in cultural sphere, in the scientific sphere, and a sense that before there can be a thought of a return of independence, Polish society needs to be improved in a holistic way, and often using a kind of organic, a set of organic metaphors uh, that sort of relate to um, uh, thinking in the biological sciences of the time. There's an interest in Darwin and then in social Darwinism and the idea that there's a process of evolution of societies and that fit societies survive uh, better than uh, societies that are uh, in some way sick. And that is the kind of language that's used, this kind of biological sort of organic uh, language. But there's also an interest in social justice, there's an interest in social equality, there's an interest in improving education across the society, um, a kind of uh, post a sort of enlightenment, a return to sort of enlightenment um, ideals of, sort of rationality and um, spreading knowledge across uh, the society. And so in this period, the novel is conceived of very, it's obviously in the realist tradition of this late 19th century. And the purpose of the novel is to continue and to further um, that broader process of improving Polish society and educating Polish society. Often it has a didactic purpose. It's meant to re- reflect social reality in the Polish lands of the of the partitions, and particularly it's focused on Warsaw uh, and, the, and the Russian uh, partition. So to reflect various social problems, to reflect the diversity of different parts of the society, which includes the peasantry, includes Jewish communities, um, it includes the, the growing um, urban proletariat, uh, and it has an interest in all, in all these different groups, and quite often a kind of hostility to the the old gentry as a as a sort of corrupt formation that is a kind of sick part of the organism in a way and holding it back. But that's what the novel should do. It should diagnose those social problems in a way that reflects social reality. Sienkiewicz is sort of starts his career um, in general terms under the auspices of that movement. And he comes out, he attends the so-called Szkoła Główna in Warsaw, um, which is the 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 main school uh, in Warsaw, which is an educational institution, which is a, a hotbed for positivist ideas. Some of his early works are in this tradition somewhat, but he essentially moves away from it. He moves away from it and is criticised significantly by other positivist writers and intellectuals for doing this by this turn to the historical novel and the sense that this overly intellectualized sort of didactic uh, idea of trying to in some way educate or improve uh, the reader, perhaps against his or her will, um, is not art, it's not literature, and it's perhaps not exactly what the society needs anyway. And in in a sense, what he suggests is what the society needs is a kind of hope, is a kind of 
um, faith uh, in in its historical past and therefore potentially in its future is a kind of compensatory myth, a set of compensatory myths of strength and power. Um, and, and this is what he delivers uh, in these novels, which are page turners. Um, they're, they're brilliantly written. They're extraordinarily imaginative. And the, the breadth uh, of the vision that, that Shinkevich puts on the page, uh, the, the extraordinary scope of the landscapes that he's describing, of these uh, Ukrainian landscapes, in fact, which he never... He never visited uh, himself. And there are some scholars who suspect, in fact, you mentioned the Californian context earlier on. Shinkiewicz, of course, was in the United States and mostly in California um, uh, for, for some time. And there are some scholars who think that his images of sort of the wild, the wild lands of southern uh, Ukraine are, are, in fact, based on his experiences in, in uh, America. Um, but the extraordinarily imaginative and extraordinarily successful with those readers. So in that sense, Shenkevich is a turn against this positivist tradition that he comes out of with its faith in science, in progress, a kind of sober rationalism and realism. He wants to return to imagination, to history, and to a kind of uh, a faith in the mission of the national community on some level. You want to uh, lay out the novel for us? Uh, you know what happens, who are the main characters, and all that. Well, I mean, the novel is uh, is set in these Ukrainian lands, uh, the, the south southeastern lands of the Polish uh, Lithuanian Commonwealth, and it uh, mixes together a set of fictional characters with uh, historical characters from the period of the Khmelnytsky uprising. Um, and so 1648 is the year in which the uprising um, breaks out. Uh, and the novel is set in the years 1648 and, and 49. And it um, is centered around a set of um, historical battles. It chooses to end with two battles in which the Polish, in inverted commas, again, <laughs> forces were victorious. So it sort of creates this framing that allows the reader to have a sense. I mean, this is a difficult time for the Commonwealth. In in some ways, looking back retrospectively, this is the beginning of the Commonwealth's long decline as this civil conflict um, creates a situation in which a large part of those eastern lands would eventually be joined to the Russian Empire. Um, from later in the 17th century, the Commonwealth would lose those lands uh, forever, essentially. Uh, and it would the process of decline would, would continue from there. So Sienkiewicz uh, chooses a t- difficult time for the Commonwealth, but he frames the novel in such a way that you have the rebellion, you have the catastrophe of the destruction of the rebellion, which is described in the novel, the beginnings of the rebellion. It, it very... Um, vivid and sometimes disturbing and descriptions of the of the violence it's a very very violent uh, novel and quite gory uh, descriptions of uh, of torture and um and uh, massacres of civilians and, and and soldiers in these lands and it describes all of that and then it describes the commonwealth's forces coming back together to fight back against this Rebellion and it, and it finishes at a at a point where there's success with a with a great uh, battle uh, in which the Commonwealth's forces are uh, victorious and Khmelnytsky at least for the time seems to be uh, defeated. So that's the history and Khmelnytsky is a character in the novel. Um, and so, as you said, is Jeremy Wisniewski this character who's a, one of the great Polish lords of the Eastern lands. Now, calling him Polish is already problematic, as you uh, alluded to before, because he is one of these lords who... Uh, so what what should, what should we call him? So Wisniewski in Ukrainian or Wisniewski in Polish? Well, both. And he is uh, he belongs to one of the great uh, Ruthenian princely uh, families, and he speaks Ruthenian. And he is an Eastern Orthodox lord um, who un- understands himself as affiliated with this tradition of Rus uh, that his family comes out of. But in the 1630s, he's one of the last of uh, these Eastern lords to convert to Roman Catholicism. And this is a process that I was talking about before, a process that 
creates this sort of symbolic shift in the region, a region which had always had these very unequal social relations between peasantry and the and the lords that that uh, were the ruling class. But now that social distinction was also mirrored by a religious distinction, that the lords were Roman Catholic. And it's complex why they were converting, and they were converting in part because there were privileges. The, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, though, it's renowned as a tolerant state by the stand religiously and by the standards of the Europe of its time, which is true. But that doesn't mean that it was an entirely neutral state uh, with respect to denomination. And Roman Catholicism always had privileges and increasingly came to dominate. So there were various um, privileges and um, positions that were not open to people of the Orthodox faith, uh, faith, and that so Catholicism and the Polish language became the religion and language and culture of power in a way. And so that's the extent to which those colonial narratives are at least partly true. And yet, Wisniewiecki uh, converted uh, voluntarily, as did as did the other lords. But under what kinds of pressures? Those would be. So he's a character, and he's the main figure on on the. In, Polish side fighting against Mielnitski. The king is also a character. Uh, but then alongside those uh, historical characters and historical events, you have this very lively and um, and uh, exciting uh, romance adventure plot where you have a set of um, fictional characters, some of whom are extremely memorable and are... Um, very, very affectionately regarded by generations of Polish uh, readers. And these characters interact at different points with some of the historical characters, but they also have this whole set of, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire type adventures, one after another, as they get into all kinds of troubles. The main character also has a love interest. And importantly, the love interest <clears throat> is captured by a Cossack. So here we have this idea of the Polish Catholic nobleman and his love and the contest for that love with the other man in inverted commas, in this case, a Ukrainian man. So this is again a place uh, or a Cossack man. So this is again the case where you have that very clear sense of a, of a Polish Cossack, Polish Ruthenian, or could we say a proto-Polish Ukrainian conflict that is presented in Schenkiewicz's novel and presented from a very tendentious point of view, because it has to be said that the representations of Ukrainians, of Ruthenians and Cossacks, uh, have been challenged from the very beginning by Ukrainian readers. Uh, so by Ukrainian hi historians in the late 19th, from, from the late 19th century, uh, there were already criticisms of the novel for uh, its historical uh, inaccuracy um, on on various points and for a very negative representation of uh, of Ukrainians. And those debates would go on uh, through the 20th century. They were particularly heated in the 1930s um, when the interwar Polish state, which had a large Ukrainian minority, which was the majority in the southeast lands of that interwar state, and and through to today, and so I think I think the novel um, very much uh, has that reputation as being one that that demonizes Ukrainians. I mean, even in the I have here the uh, school edition uh, of the <laughs> of the novel that Ukraine that uh, Polish schoolchildren uh, read, um, and in the in, in the sort of apparatus that the schoolchildren are given, it uh, specifically says that the novel demonizes Ukrainians. Now. We can scholars might debate different aspects of that, but that's how it's being presented to to Polish uh, school children. Um, today. Do you have a good example of, a, of a, one of those one of those demonizing passages? There are numerous. There are some passages when one of the main characters, so the main the, the sort of central character is called Jan Skrzetuski, and he is a Polish uh, nobleman who's loyal to the great Lord Jeremy Wisniewiecki, who we've been talking about. And uh, and he is captured by uh, by the Cossack forces essentially, and he and he is um, taken uh, to their encampment um, in the sort of lower reaches uh, of of well, on the on the Dnipro River, uh, and he sees sort of some horrific scenes of uh, frenzied violence and drunkenness of the Cossack warriors and what they're doing 
um, as they're essentially resting uh, in their encampment and sort of torture of uh, a prisoner, um, drunkenness, lasciviousness, and very frequently descriptions in the novel that liken these people to animals. So there's a sort of literal best set of bestializing um, descriptions. Um, the historic term um, chern, which is related to the word charne, which means black, and we could sort of translate loosely as sort of black mob, um, is used to describe the Ruthenian uh, peasantry um, in a way that some critics even suggest might have a kind of racialized overtone, which we can again fit together with those sort of colonial uh, interpretations. Other Others uh, say that, that, that that's not the case, that there's a different uh, etymology. But nevertheless, th there's a whole network of bestializing uh, descriptions uh, of the Ukrainian characters and the Ukrainian forces, whereas the Polish forces are also violent. And in fact, Wisniewski is described as being brutal as well as he's putting down the uprising. Um, but it's a kind of ordered, organized uh, violence that is, at least in the terms of the novel, presented as being the arm of law, right? The arm of legitimate authority, reimposing order on chaos um, and, and frenzy. So it's a kind of righteous violence in the way that it's presented in the novel. So, so that dichotomy uh, is, is clearly there. Um, in those uh, representations, um, and the, the some of the scenes are, are really quite horrific of the uh, of, of the Cossacks and and the, the sort of frenzy of violence in which they're um, well, in fact, murdering one of and torturing uh, one one of their own uh, in in the scene that I'm referring to. Right. Do you want to look at that uh, at that uh, that passage of uh, Khmelnytsky's complaint as to? You know, what they're actually fighting for. So the, the complaint is uh, this. Look around at what is going on in the Ukraine. Oh, rich land, motherland, native land. And who in her is sure of tomorrow? Who in her is happy? Who is not robbed of his faith, spoiled of his freedom? Who in her is not weeping and sighing, save only the Vishnevetskys, the Pototskys, the Zaslavskys, Kalinovskys, Konyetspolskys, and a handful of nobles? For them are crown estates, dignities, land, and people. For them, happiness and golden freedom. And the rest of the nation in tears stretch forth their hands to heaven, waiting for the pity of God, since the pity of the king cannot help them. How many, even of the nobility, unable to bear this intolerable oppression, have fled to the sitch, as I myself has, have fled? I want no war with the king. I want no war with the commonwealth. It is the mother... And he is the father. The king is a merciful lord, but the kinglets, with them, it is impossible for us to live. Their extortions, their rents, um, meadow taxes, mill taxes, eye and horn taxes, their tyranny and oppression exercised through the agency of Jews cry for vengeance. What thanks has the Zaporizhian army received for great services rendered in numerous wars? Where are the Cossack rights? The king gave them, the kinglets took them away. Nalivaika quartered, Pavlyuk burned in a brazen bull. The blood is not dry on the wounds inflicted by the sabers of Zolkievsky and Konyetspolsky. The tears have not dried for those killed and impaled on stakes. And now look, what is gleaming in the sky? Here, Khmelnytsky pointed uh, through the window at the flaming comet, and there's a there's a comet that actually historically had you know uh, passed over, passed over the earth at that time. Shankiewicz starts the novel with that sense of there being signs in the heavens and earth. So it's a very interesting passage, and of course it uh, and critics who want to um, complicate that that claim or perhaps even uh, refute to some extent the claim that. The novel is exclusively negative in its representation of Ukrainians. Often, bring up this passage, so the sense that the Ukrainian perspective is given, right? So Khmelnytsky's complaint um, gives that sense of the Ukrainian perspective. But that perspective, it's only it's one moment in the novel, and it's spoken by a character who, in general, is very negatively represented. So Khmelnytsky is represented as a sort of petty 
violent, chaotic man uh, who is who has launched the uprising essentially on the basis of his own personal uh, dispute um, with a with a Polish uh, nobleman, and it's a it's a it's a, a negative representation. Uh, and then he is refuted by Jan Skrzetuski, the character with whom uh, he is speaking, the, this, this central character of the novel, the Polish Catholic nobleman. And, and there are two arguments that um, Skrzetuski raises. First of all, he does actually, to some extent, acknowledge that the relations are not perfect uh, in these regions. The relations are not perfect between the, uh, what you, in your translation was kinglets, but I think that the, the princes uh, or the great lords of these eastern uh, eastern lands. The translation it was Jeremiah Curtin, isn't it? Probably? Yeah, yeah. It, it's unfortunate that there isn't like really a great translation. There's a more recent one, but it's uh, it was when it came out, it was generally criticized for being uh, embellished. So we have either the old stodgy one with a lot of awkward language, uh, or we have the uh, the new one that has stuff that's that's not there. Um, and and I I could imagine you know a couple of uh, a couple of fine translators who could. Uh, that's right. If anybody. Uh, watching this with a with an eye to um, retranslating a classic of Polish literature. Uh, I'm talking about you, David French, if you're out there, or because uh, <laughs> uh, I think you know he, he does the language of Sapkowski. I mean, it would be perfect yes. for for yes. this, or or, may, or maybe uh, maybe Anna Zarenko, you know, who's taken on uh, uh, big thick novels of uh, of, uh, of Polish realism. Um, you know, she could you know she could probably do this. Absolutely. Um, so. He 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 says that yes, relations aren't perfect, but but what have you achieved with this rebellion? Which uh, first of all, he says is against the law. He refers to the majesty of the law and of the uh, Commonwealth, uh, and is saying that it's wrong simply for that reason. But secondly, he describes the way in which um, the consequences for the very people that Hmielnicki claims to be representing. Uh, and the people uh, for for whom he is fighting uh, and that for whom he claims to be the representative of justice, they are the very people who have suffered the most under this rebellion. And Skrzetowski points this out and describe, describes the way in which, uh, and, and this there are scenes in the novel that, that also um, describe this, of Ruthenian peasants uh, being murdered en masse or sold into slavery for the Tatars, um, he talks about uh, women being raped in these uh, villages, um, villages being burnt to the ground, the country and the fields being completely uh, destroyed and turned into back into desert and wilderness, essentially. And of course, Skrzetowski himself in this uh, conversation also raises that uh, colonial idea of it is the Poles that have created order in these lands. It is the Poles that have made them fertile and that have protected them. Um, so he makes all of those arguments and, and says, essentially, all you have brought is destruction and terror uh, and nothing else to Milnitsky. And Milnitsky really has no rejoinder to this. He gets very angry in the conversation, uh, but it, it, it is not a balanced exchange of views in which uh, the reasons really anywhere in the novel for the rebellion are explored uh, in, with any real sort of neutral uh, attention or curiosity. But very importantly, what he then goes on to say is to make is essentially to make the point that that I was raising before uh, about also, um, well, who are these lords that you're complaining about? And he says, uh, is this not blood of your blood, the bones of your bones? Is this not your nobility? Are these not your own princes? And so when, what he's referring to here is what we were discussing earlier, the fact that there is no simplistic way in which a character like Wisniewiecki, who is one of these princes, is Polish. These are uh, the uh, these are Ruthenians, and they describe themselves as Ruthenian. So that that is uh, Skrzetowski's argument. Um, of course, the rejoinder to that is that they you know they have cut themselves off uh, from the Ruthenian uh, community, and they are traitors essentially to that community. And that is historically how those um, figures were often understood uh, at that time. But that's the, it's, it is a very interesting moment, uh, in the novel. And it is true that a Ukrainian perspective is 
presented or voiced through uh, Khmelnytsky, but it, it's certainly not presented in a balanced way um, in that conversation. Uh, Skrzetuski's perspective is much more powerful in the way that the scene uh, the scene is framed. Khmelnytsky is also drinking through the uh, drinking vodka through the conversation. Uh, and there are all kinds of ways in which the framing of the scene um, it, it denigrates the credibility of that perspective as against the Polish uh, perspective. And that's these are the reasons that the novel has been so negatively received by generations of Ukrainian readers and by Ukrainian scholars. And today would often be viewed that way in Poland as well, as I've said, by Polish scholars. Th that would be a shortcoming uh, of uh, a significant shortcoming uh, of of the novel from today's perspective, and perhaps above all, in the perspective of the very present day, yes. in which Ukraine is fighting a war for its survival against um, a, a, a sort of neo imperialist, uh, neo colonial um, tyranny uh, from Russia, and in which Poles and Poland are in the front line of supporters uh, of Ukraine and Ukrainians. So, particularly in that context. This this novel um, might be might be viewed as being an a, 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 it's it's the difficult past between Poles and Ukrainians, and in which the president of Ukraine is is Jewish. Um, so, you know, to, to further yes. further further yes. complicate this. I mean, I I'm, I'm, I was thinking like you know reading this now compared to I, you know, I was recalling you know reading it as you know as kind of an exercise you know in graduate school you know in the nineties you know long ago and uh, you know thinking about it in the context of the literary history of positivism and so forth and and and. Uh, frankly, being much more interested in, you know, the other avant-garde writers that I write about uh, than in uh, in Shinkiewicz. Uh, and now, you know, here we are. Uh, we're all, uh, you know, those of us who are who are engaged, uh, you know, are you know closely following the war in Ukraine. We you know, suddenly you know, have this knowledge of the of the geography that we didn't have uh, or that I didn't have, uh, you know, uh, 30 years ago um, that, you know, we uh, you know, see you know, the you know, a reference to you know various little villages and say oh wait I, I know where that is Hulai Pola that's you know just upriver of uh, of Kherson yes yeah, so, so we can you know things things are much more um, much more clear and you know we, we kind of realize that you know some of the the issues in this war are are still you know they're they're not ideological things but they're part of nature like that the uh, uh, you know in the spring uh, the you know the rains uh, are preventing the you know the you know we've been you know for those of us following you know for the last several weeks you know people have been asking so when, when is the counteroffensive going to start uh when is when is the ukrainian counteroffensive start well when the mud is gone because you can't move the tanks and the heavy equipment and then you know sure enough in uh, in shinkevich uh, there's this problem of well can we bring the hussars in while well, the hussars have heavy armor and they're on like bigger horses and so they you know we have to worry about the hussars getting bogged down in the mud and that hasn't uh, the mud is still there uh uh, or uh, what do you do in the winter? Well, in the winter, you don't have any cover of, uh, of trees and so forth. So you uh, you dig in and there's the same question about uh, about the Cossacks that uh, that I think, uh, you know, we've you know, that uh, people analysts today have posed about the Russians. Well, if they retreat, does that mean that they're uh, or call for a ceasefire? Are they really retreating or are they just trying to regroup and dig in? Um, and that was exactly the same thing that uh, that Shinkevich is suggesting about uh, about the uh, uh, the Cossacks, you know, in the time of the Khmelnytsky uh, rebellion. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, for you, I mean, has the, you know, it, you know, do you read the novel differently um, in light of uh, in light of what's going on? It's a good good question about how how a novel like this appears today. I mean, as I said, I think I, I think in Poland in in general, what in Polish readers too, you know, might might be more in, inclined to uh, to see those anti sort of Ukrainian dimensions a, a bit more clearly given in, in in the current context, which is such a such a pro Ukrainian uh, context in in Poland today, um, but also to see you know some of the complexity and the diff and the challenges of those that relationship uh, through history that has really been overcome uh, in the present day. So I think reading the novel today, just as 
reading the history of 20th century relations between Poles and Ukrainians. And again, to use the term Poles and Ukrainians in a simplistic way about Sienkiewicz's novel, as if it's the same thing as Poles and Ukrainians today, is very problematic. We're talking about different categories in the in the 17th century. But to, to simplify very, very broad terms, um, in some ways I think one might be inclined to read this history as uh, a record of what has been overcome in, in the present and that this extraordinary solidarity uh, of individual Poles, of civil society, um, the Polish state on multiple different levels uh, with Ukraine is even more remarkable uh, because of the history that it follows, the history of conflict uh, between Poles and Ukrainians in different uh, ways, in different periods, and often with extraordinary violence. And this book is a record of extraordinary violence. Um, it is a novel that dwells upon war, on fighting and killing, and on a fighting and killing that in the terms, in fact, in the conversation that we've just been getting at on Fmielnitsky and Skrzetuski, that is, that is uh, Skrzetuski's uh, accusation. This is fratricidal violence. He uses those terms, that the, that the fighting between Poles and Ukrainians, precisely because those terms are so imprecise, and with a figure like Vishniewiecki, how do you describe him? He speaks Polish, he speaks Ruthenian, he's Roman Catholic, he was Eastern Orthodox, he's descended from uh, this Ruthenian uh, family, but he's an important part of the power structures of the broader Pol Polish uh, Lithuanian Commonwealth, and he leads Polish forces uh, in conflict against uh, Ukrainian-speaking, let's say, uh, Cossacks. Um, you know, it's it's very hard to 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 tease out exactly the identity uh, of these characters. Uh, but nevertheless, it it is this record of violence between groups that are in some way intertwined. Uh, and obviously, the present day is about recognizing the way in which that sort of these groups are uh, distinct and different, but but have common interests, have common values, um, and have a common history that is uh, often difficult, um, but that I suppose has been overcome above all, of course, because of a because of a common enemy uh, and because of the the aggression. Uh, of the Russian uh, invasion and and the sense among many Poles that this is something that is historically familiar and that they uh, identify with and therefore that they there's a real emotional sense beyond the pure interest. There's interest as well, strategic interest, but there is an emotional identification of many Poles um, with with the Ukrainian cause. So I think looking at this novel, I, I do I suppose think of it as a as a representation and a very tendentious representation in, in its own way, but a very successful work of fiction as well. As I said, it's a, it's, it's extraordinarily well written and constructed and extraordinary in its imagination, but is a representation of this violence between, um, between uh, the predecessors of peoples uh, who today stand together against um, against Russian aggression uh, in regions, uh, many of which are described in the novel and which are the sites of, uh, of, of conflict uh, in this novel. So I suppose I, I read it um, in, in that sense uh, today. And on that note, uh, let me uh, ask you, um, so if somebody uh, wants to uh, study Polish literature at Cambridge, we have many students who watch our program, um, can you say a few words about the program? Polish is uh, a subject that uh, you can take uh, at Cambridge as part of a broader degree in modern languages. Um, the faculty is called a slightly old-fashioned faculty name, which is Modern and Medieval Languages and Linguistics. That's the name of our faculty, and it's essentially um, modern languages, modern European languages for the most part. And so this is the place where people study German, French, Spanish uh, literature, culture, language, and among the literatures, cultures, and languages that uh, that students at Cambridge can study, Polish uh, is one of them. So, since two thousand and fourteen, when the uh, Polish Studies Program uh, was established, was established uh, at Cambridge. So, and since then, it's been thriving with a good, uh, uh, impressive number of students that come through every year, and, and very, very impressive students that we have um, every year. 
Uh, and so I would very much welcome uh, applications for undergraduate students who are interested in studying at Cambridge, um, but uh, in, in, in particular, perhaps also for postgraduate students. So if you're interested in doing an MPhil, which is what we call a kind of MA degree uh, here in Cambridge, or a PhD uh, on a subject that's related to Polish culture, history, literature, um, then uh, please do very uh, feel very free to, to reach out, including reaching out um, to me, and uh, I'm certainly open to supervising projects in those areas. And uh, I think that there is a growing recognition that an understanding of this region, of the region, of, you know, the broad region of Central and Eastern Europe, is more and more significant, and that there has been a kind of knowledge deficit uh, in this region, and that knowledge deficit has hindered, I think, to some degree, Western responses to Russian aggression uh, in the region over the last 10 years, um, simply through lack of understanding of the region. And I hope that there's a growing recognition that that needs to be rectified, uh, and that means that um, it's it's really important for programs and study of uh, Ukraine above all, and we have a thriving Ukrainian studies program at Cambridge as well, um, which is and that's, that's another subject that students can take here. And I would very strongly um, encourage anybody uh, to consider those options. Uh, but then with one of my uh, former students, Rory Finnan, who uh, Rory Finnan. Yeah, who is uh, who also uh, has a, has an interest in Polish, and uh, he uh, in one of my uh, in my uh, Polish Renaissance poetry course at uh, Columbia wrote an excellent paper that uh, won an award and got published. And uh, uh, Kochanowski and Kochanowski, yeah, and Jan Kochanowski, yes, exactly. So the, he's uh, here, and also with Olenka Pevny. Um, uh, who works on uh, medieval and uh, early modern uh, periods. Uh, and uh, we, we, so we have a strong Ukrainian studies program um, here as well. Uh, so that's uh, what our Slavonic studies department has that sort of diversity as well, as well as, of course, Russian studies um, within that broader faculty of European uh, languages. Also, before you go, let me ask you, uh, you have a new, uh, you're a co-editor of a, uh, a new uh, uh, Routledge anthology of essays on uh, the history of Polish literature, are you not? Yes, so the Routledge uh, World Companion uh, to Polish Literature, which came out late 2021, which... Uh, it feels readers, new to me still. <laughs> it's still fair, it feels new to me as well, but it takes readers through... Uh, a history of Polish literature through key texts. So it's interpretations of key texts of Polish literature from Bogorodzica, um, the early uh, medieval, well, the late medieval song, often described as the first work of Polish literature, um, through to uh, Olga Tukarczuk, uh, and including a chapter on uh, Sienkiewicz for that matter. But it, it, it looks at individual texts, and we have um, over 30 uh, contributions from a wide range of experts on Polish literature from across uh, the world. Um, for those interested in the Commonwealth, there's a, a volume um, that I've co-edited with Simon Lewis, which is coming out in October. I think it's available already on online booksellers called Multicultural Commonwealth, Poland, Lithuania and its Afterlives, uh, which grapples with the questions of the historical diversity of the Commonwealth. And it takes multiple different perspectives on that diversity, looks at Jewish communities, at Tatar communities, at Ruthenians, at um, uh, Germans at uh, the Lithuanian dimension and many other uh, parts of the Commonwealth's uh, um, diversity, uh, but then also looks at the afterlives of that diversity, which means the ways in which it, the Commonwealth has been represented in culture, uh, in works of art, uh, but also the way in which that history is contested in different ways by modern day states by modern day um, scholars and historians um, in representations in museums and how that history is reconstructed uh, in the present. Um, so that book is coming out uh, in October this year. All right, we'll try to mention both of those in the uh, bibliography on the uh, introduction page for this episode. So Stanley, thanks so much for uh, joining me on the program. Thank you very much for having me. Don't go away. Please subscribe and click the bell to receive notifications about new videos from the Polish Cultural Institute New York. Go to the Polish Cultural Institute's website, linked in the description down below, to see a full schedule of upcoming episodes. Stay tuned for the credits for some recommendations about how you can support aid for Ukraine and for Ukrainians fleeing the war in their country. 
I'd like to thank all the people who helped make this series possible. The Polish Cultural Institute New York sponsors our program. Bartek Remisko, Head of Humanities and Literature at the Polish Cultural Institute New York, is our executive producer. Natalia Iudin is my fellow producer and editor. Claudia Ofwana Draber is Head of Communications at the Polish Cultural Institute New York. Our opening and closing music is by Radek Przedpelski. Thank you all for listening and reading along with us. Let's meet again in a month, as we do, when our old friend Benjamin Paloff will be back to discuss the writer and rap artist who showed that the fall of communism was not the end of history, Dorota Maslowska. See you then. Cała sceneria dodaje się w plany fotografiom z ilustrowanej gazety. Tak szare, tak płaskie są domy, ludzie i pojazdy.